and then so each of you will have five to seven minutes to talk about your your work um and if you want to read it you can if you don't want to read it you don't have to you can just talk about it it's entirely up to you but annie Faye can show it hey here we go i think we just started oh yeah <laughs> expensive to adjust I they see Mark Zuckerberg in Alulala. He's in such a hurry today. And so, all right. Huff, but hey, I'm just going to check to make sure that we are indeed live. It's not showing up. Oh, that's good. Yeah. All right, there we are. All right. All right. Buenas. Todos buena hudzo. Nan husi Michael Luhan de Vakwa. Thank you for tuning in for this very special virtual launch of the Kulu Zine, published by Independent Guahan and featuring the the wonderful work of all of the people that I have, and not all of, but of the people that are in the Zoom with me, as well as some others who couldn't join us. Today, we are officially launching this, uh, this zine, um, and we will be speaking to some of the contributors, uh, the graphic artists who helped put it together, um, and we will be taking your questions as well, showing you the zine where you can find it on island um, or, or virtually where you can download it and check it out. But before we get into that, uh, I wanted to introduce uh, myself, Michael Luhan Bavakwa. I am the co-chair for Independent Guahan, and then I am the co the co-chair for the media committee for Independent Guahan. And then my my co-chair with me on the media committee is Annie Fay Camacho, um, who's also helped put together uh, this zine as well as this virtual launch. Um, and so Independent Guahan, if you are unfamiliar with the work that Independent Guahan does, we, prior to the pandemic, we had regular meetings in the community. Um, we organize regular events such as concerts. Uh, we've had uh, art shows, mural paintings in the past. We look forward to the pandemic being over so we can get back into the community once again. Uh, but over the past two years, we have been creating more digital and virtual opportunities for people to connect, for people to educate and so on. And um, Independent Guahan, as you can imagine from the name, it is about promoting the idea of independence for Guam. Guam is a territory, it is a colony. Um, you could call it a possession if it makes you feel better, but that kind of makes me feel worse than territory or colony. Lohagulaman, it is entirely up to you. It is what, it's whatever you want to do with your breath or your brain cells. But in independent Guahan, we don't think that that's a good thing, that Guam is in that position. We think that that's a position that shouldn't exist anymore. There shouldn't be any colonies, possessions, territories left in the world. And we think that the way, the best way forward for Guam, for the Chamorro people, is to pursue independence, pursue sovereignty, uh, pursue uh, equal relationships with partners in the region, around the world. That is what we feel would be the best political future for the island. But we definitely encourage no matter what you, no matter where you stand on these issues, all people that we should unite, Chamorros and non-Chamorros, we should unite behind the idea that we should leave the territorial status that we are in right now. That we should work towards getting to a, a, a genuinely self-governing future uh, for the people who love Guam. And so to this end, we do all sorts of stuff, all sorts of work in the community, podcasts, uh, mural paintings, we produce educational materials, uh, social media videos, everything like that. And our latest effort is the Kulu Zine. Uh, we put out a call for, pay we put out a call for artists, for artwork, 
uh, late, last, uh, late last year, and we were excited that 18 artists contributed their work uh, to us, and we were even more excited that uh, Helen, who's with us today, she was willing to volunteer her time to put it all together, to format it, to edit it, and to also put up with uh, the thousand little notes that me and Annie Faye gave her uh, when we had accidentally spelled somebody's name wrong, put in nine extra vowels that it only needed, six extra vowels, all sorts of little stuff like that. And so uh, we definitely thank Helen and we'll be hearing from her in a second. But before that, I wanna pass off to Annie Faye who can who will be sharing with us the the recently relaunched independent wahan website where you can find the zine hey this is us my asi um as i get started you know i I'm, I'm manifesting i hope everyone will manifest for me good wi-fi uh the rain has uh not blessed me today so hopefully we can make through my share screen smoothly right oh okay so what i'm going to show you guys is just uh the independent guahan site where everyone could find the zine so right here's just the landing page where um has our mission um our social medias our events resources everything like that that you want to find and up here our menu hadzi ham Again, manifesting great Wi-Fi, and it's with us today. Okay, um, this is where you're going to find more about our mission, what we do here at Independent Guahan, um, and the team. So, like I said, me and Maget are with the Media and Solidarity Committee. Look at that wonderful beard. Look at that long hair. We miss it all from Maget. Um, and this is the other um, wonderful people, wonderful committees we have, the art and outreach by Key and Monyeka, uh, Lola and Francine with education, development and research, Jonathan and Jesse, and then Carrie Ann over here. Wonderful people putting in a great, um, so much of their time to make independent Guahan run smoothly. Then over here, of course, uh, the one we know and love, Fanatsu Guam, uh, Independent Guahan's official podcast. So if you don't know already, we've started changing um, our format. We used to have it, you know, just in-person video or podcast, but now we do it a lot on Zoom. So you can find us on Facebook, but now we also do our stuff on Spotify for those of you guys with your one hour car rides over there in the States, up on those highways you know, bring us along with you on your ride. And then also, of course, our Patreon, um, which, you know, love for you to go through. And then one of the things a lot of people have been asking us, especially educators or people that just kind of want to know more about not just the organization Independent Guaham, but about independence and what it means. We have a resource page where you can look at three different things. So is that's our uh, our handouts that we usually give for um, our general assemblies that cover a whole range of topics. And then this one is the other things that Independent Guam Han has made, like our testimonies, our position statements, and other handouts. And then if you really want to go above and beyond, we also have the scholarly articles about things like independence in other nations, um, economic development, um, sovereignty, so many things that you can find out more about by clicking any of these links. And then our Mega Tao Tao page. So this page is dedicated to um, our Mega Tao Tao and our GA. So one of the things we've been doing with our General Assemblies is every General Assembly we've been honoring someone that's really been a positive influence on the community. So just February, we honored David, uh, David Flores. And over here, you could watch the GA directly from the website, or you could um, be redirected to the Facebook page. And this one last, last month was a great one um, on with Chris Rosario with beekeeping. That guy's so knowledgeable. I'm this close to getting a beehive in my own yard, but you know, I still have to run it by the family. We're still working on that. And then next, lastly, 
of course, events, but then the reason we're here, the Kuluzine, right? So from here, if from here, if you're not in Guam, if you guys wanted to, we're gonna be in that, we're gonna be putting out some flyers about where you could get it physically. So right now, where you could get a free physical copy. Um, do I have one near my person? No, I don't have one next to my body, but um, you can find a free physical copy with Numalu Refillery, Antigua Brewery, Isiga Coffee Shop, and Fuuna Cultures. But online, here we have the wonderful zine. You guys have all put in so much amazing, great work for. And speaking of great work, I think I want to now um, tee off to Helen, our graphic designer, who you know, I'm so grateful for. She really volunteered a lot of her time, um, put up with all my, hey, Helen, one more, one more edit, please. You know, all those time I'm like, hey, can you move this five pixels to the left? Um, so Helen, half a day. Let me just stop my share screen real quick. All right, Helen, so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, your thoughts on the zine, your process on the zine, and also just um, the topics and some of the pieces that you read on the zine that maybe stood out to you. Okay, um, half a day, everyone. Um, I'm Helen, um, and I did the graphic design for the zine. Um, I guess the process behind the zine was, um, I guess, full disclosure, I've been making zines since 2017, I run my own zine collective called Migrant Zine Collective in Aotearoa, which is where I'm, um, I guess, based. And um, I guess the process of it was very much like, we just, I guess we just worked from the Dropbox, really. Um, all of it was digital and a lot of, similar to a lot of the zines I've made during the pandemic, everything was digital and done through like you know google drive and dropbox um yeah i it was i guess this is one of the first um collab collaborative projects i've done in guahan um and it was um quite different i guess working with a in a different activist setting um and yeah i'm not sure um do you want to um, kind of give me another question prompt or something? Go ahead and uh, share it. Anything? Go ahead and uh, share the the zine, and then Helen can. If Helen, if you want to point out maybe some of the stuff that some of the stuff that you enjoyed about sort of working on it, or or mm -hmm. even some of the choices that you made in terms of because. Uh, for example, for many of the photos in it, you know, it was a it was a folder filled with photos by Alfred Bordalio, and then you chose some of them. You also had a like a folder from Independent Guahan filled with stuff, and so yeah. If you want to share some of the some of the 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 things that you found interesting as you were working on, it. um, I guess let me see a physical copy of it. Um, I have one here that Annie dropped off for me. Um, but yeah, I guess just putting it together, I kind of just, um, I mean, I guess I just put together pieces that I felt looked and like looked coherent and suited the theme as well um, with the artworks. And um, yeah, I guess I don't have much to elaborate on. Um, I've done design work for quite a while now. So um, a lot of this was just according to like the things I've learned through making zines. Um, and yeah, some of my favorites are probably like this one. Um, like if someone talks about nature in their piece, I tend to, I would put a photo that kind of matched up with that um, or yeah I guess I just went for a similar formula like um, I really like the spread as well um, yeah <laughs> oh thank you so much 
Sidus Masi Helen. And remember, if any of you have any questions, feel free to, to comment them uh, or send them to me. Uh, remember, if you don't have WhatsApp, if you don't have Messenger, you can always tie your questions to sort of the, the neck of a, a hilitai and then send the hilitai my way. All right. And so let's get into the, we have Hatsa, Una, two, no, Hugo, I'm going to, ancient numbers are so hard. Uno, dos, tres. Cuatro, cinco, co cinco, Amzo? Are, are you, are there five or are there six of you? I think there's five of you. We have five artists here, five contributors. And so Clarissa Mingiola, put forward, maybe if you want to go first. Um, and then just sort of just take a few minutes. Would you like, if you would like to read something from your piece or if you would want to uh, just talk about it, but put for what, go ahead and, uh, and get started. Okay, see just Masi. Buena si Clarissa Mendiola, just Masa Gadu Giza e Tano Ramatush Aloni Natalta or San Francisco. And Sizas Maasi, Independent Guahan for the zine, for all of the work you do. I'm so grateful to be included in spaces like these as a person who was born and raised off island. It's often difficult to find ways to contribute to this movement in a meaningful way. And so um, again, just super grateful for, for the invitation to participate here. Um, I'll read from a little bit from my poem um, entitled, What Does It Mean? And it's a longer one. So I'll just read the first few stanzas and then I'll talk a little bit about it. So this is called, What Does It Mean? To be lost on our home island when we assumed your sustenance. At a certain point, we stopped counting the miles, the blisters, the tiny stinging slits of skin where sore grass quietly conducts its rebellion. We stop wincing at the sound of our saturated footsteps, at the dissonance of our American accents, which constantly betray us, at the sloppy weight of our hiking shoes soaked in the same mud mom wiped off her feet as a girl before school to keep her poverty hidden. No, we wear smears of red dirt across our brows as if ceremony to rejoice in this elusive homecoming while we search and search for you. We follow ancestral protocol with purest intention. Yet you remain hidden. Isn't the map etched beneath our skin? Why won't our blood bring it to surface? Um, so I'll stop there and I'll just talk a little bit about the experience that inspired this piece. And it's pretty much what you might think. My family and I were visiting Guam and we were on a hike and we couldn't find the place we were trying to find. Um, full disclosure, we were trying to find Sigua Falls and we couldn't find the falls. We ended up calling that journey Sigua Fails because it felt a little bit like a failure. Um, and as a poet, it immediately struck me as sort of this allegory for a feeling that I've had my whole life as a Chamorro person born away from the islands. Um, you know, the sensation of feeling lost or untethered or without a place to anchor. And um, then in this piece, I explore all of those little experience a Chamorro person in diaspora might explore around not feeling Chamorro enough. Um, in it, I recite, you know, the phrase where we ask for permission to enter, enter the jungle, um, almost as a way to ask for permission to claim my identity as a Chamorro person, um, to, to claim my Chamorroness, um, my sense of indigeneity. And, you know, those feelings of disenfranchisement, of marginalization are all direct results and direct harms of colonialism. And that's why the work of independent Guahan is so vital for us as a people um, to claim our indigenous futures. Um, and then I think of my children. Um, I have two kids and they now represent the second generation of my family that has been born off island and they have not been to Guam yet. And I wonder how they'll be able to orient themselves in the world that they live in when there's such a distance between where we are and where our ancestors are from. 
Um, so this poem ends with a wish that they do not spend their lives feeling lost, that they locate and have the agency to claim their heritage and that they can rely on their heritage as an anchor um, in the same way they can rely on my unconditional presence and love as their mother. So, Sidzus um, Maasi, thank you so much. Hi, Sidzus Maasi, Clarissa. Gef Pogwe Sinanganmu. Beautiful sentiment, beautiful. And Bunitu Itinigat Mulokwe. And so next, I want to invite Leah. Leah Gokwe, put for board if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing and Annie Faye can uh, put your piece up uh, while you were talking. But. Hafidei Tonis Hamzu, Guahu Si, Leah Gokwe, Sumasika to Giza, Kawiya Territory in so called Temecula in California. Um, my poem is Red Tide. It's a piece that I wrote in 2017 in the beginning of my uh, sculpture program at Long Beach State. Um, so I'll just read it and then share a little bit more afterwards. Every spring, the Bay of Tumhum fills with algal blooms, making the ocean appear to have dark blood stains. My nonna said it's the blood of Pali Sanvatoris, a miraculous manifestation of God's concern for the Chamorro people. Just another reason why we have to pray the rosary, Nanny, she says. And I think, just another thing you have been brainwashed into believing by the colonizer. But my only bodily response is a hidden eye roll. I learned in college that the beheading of Sanvatoris marked the start of the Spanish Chamorro Wars a 26 year period where the natives of Guahan fought to keep their freedom and eventually lost. Over those nearly 30 years, the indigenous population decreased from an estimated 100,000 to 5,000 Chamorros. Had the bloodstained red tides been interpreted from an ancient Chamorros perspective, it might've been seen as a message from those that came before us, a foretelling of the bloodshed that was to come and has come year after year after year to remind us of their ongoing fight for freedom. It's a jarring experience to come to understand one's ignorance to their own blood. Oh, sorry, it's a heavy one, right? And um, this came at a time when um, I was really just in the beginning and starting to really, really dive deep into Chamorro history on my own. And I grew up on Guam. I had Chamorro classes in school. I had Guam history my senior year, but I didn't realize how special my culture was until I moved to the States. And I had to find my identity in my own strength. And I, felt that longing for what the community and culture and closeness was from Guam. So I was always searching and that's when I learned about um, Chief Harau's speech. That's when I learned about the battle of Hanum and all of these, like, I felt like it was history that was there, but like hidden in plain sight, like, it was always available to me, but it was never told to me how, how passionate my people fought to not have this colony lifestyle. Um, and so I use this piece to kind of navigate the times when I just felt so sad and defeated about all of the truths of the Spanish Chamorro Wars and, um, studying Chief Harrell's speech and learning all of the end of that war, like was so sad. And so like, it, it's, it fuels my fire for being as Chamorro as I can be in my life every day. But it's also such a, such a pain that I feel is like, um, I'm still trying to heal for my bloodline. Um, and so yeah, that's that's mm. me. Sidus Masi. No, thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, I think for many people who you know the 
the red tide doesn't happen as much anymore, you know, because they've, you know, they've bleached the hell out of the beach to make it friendly for, <laughs> for tourists, to make it better for the selfies of tourists that are visiting the islands, right? Um, but it's, uh, it's important to, to put sort of all those layers of feeling behind sort of that, that uh, and, and then just sort of as the generations pass, as we have different stories to, to describe that as, as we respond to our elders even, right? That our, sometimes our elders may have strongly believed one thing and we may come to believe something else. So there's, thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing that. I want to invite next uh, Jillian put for what? And you have some beautiful paintings in it. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, half a day, everyone. Guahu si Jillian Duenas, the Masagat Zukitza Duwamish, Duwamish land, otherwise known as Seattle, Washington. Um, and yeah, should I just describe or? Go ahead, uh, Hongan. Uh, Annie Faye is going to share. Okay. But go ahead okay. and, and you can start talking about it because you have a, a few pieces in the zine. Yes. So uh, one of the pieces I submit is called Men. Manga Gaigi Hamguini, um, We're Still Here, which is a piece that I actually did uh, for one of my classes. I'm currently finishing up my master's of social work at the University of Washington. And I was taking a class on historical trauma. Um, and so for my final project for this class, I decided to do a deep dive into um, Guahan's history and um, turned it into something that was felt more empowering and felt more healing. Um, so I don't want to say too much because I would rather have it speak for itself, but um, the idea was kind of to bring the past, the present, and the future together and to uh, convey our resilience as a people and our ongoing fight for independence and for sovereignty and to honor um, the hardships and the traumas that our, uh, our ancestors and our elders have endured and um, what we continue to carry and are trying to navigate and heal from. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that piece and the idea behind that. Um, another piece I submitted, which is a bit more straightforward, um, was C.C. Rena. So just my uh, depiction of that story of Serena, um, something colorful and fun. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> So yeah, and then I also added some woven fish onto the canvas and incorporated um, the cave drawings of the turtles. And then the last piece I submitted is Ikaten Kulu, so called the conch. Um, and that piece I did um, in the middle of my first year in my master's program. Um, I was feeling pretty um, burnt out and pretty down about how my program was going, especially starting it um, during the COVID pandemic and having all my classes be online and then feeling like I didn't really have much community as the only Pacific Islander uh, student in my whole cohort. Um, so that was pretty difficult for me to navigate, but this piece kind of uh, speaks to me learning to call on to my community for help and lean into them for support um, call on to myself to show up for myself and to believe in myself and uh, to can you continue to carry the legacy that has been laid out for me um, by my elders in my community. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that piece. And I also glued some shells onto the canvas. Sidus Masi. And we have a we have a comment from somebody, Chris Leon Guerrero, who says, Biba Jillian, this print hangs above my workbench so that I can look at it daily. Uh, Sana Maasi, thank you so much. That makes me really happy to hear. Biba, Sidus Masi. And so where would we like to go next? I think uh Matsalik, Kwestelistuhao, Kazuhu. Hungan. Wait, oh, Bunty Tai Wing. Okay, uh, Haani, would you like to go? I think uh, Bunty Tai Wing see Matale. Oh, Hungan, I think he's there oh. though. I'm not sure. Oh, is he? 
He's not a Tima no Opi. Yeah. Oh, Enegi, Enegi. Okay. All right, Siggy. I know, uh, <laughs> Matalik, you look like you're streaming in from 2006. That's what, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, Siggy. <laughs> <laughs> Of the my own. <laughs> hungan, hungan. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, Buenas. Uh, of the day, we'll see Masolik. Uh, so Masol do pizza guahan. Um, I I have a, I think a few things I wrote in here. Um, I'm not sure. You know what exactly? I know we can read, but. I think because I have so many things that I wrote <laughs> and I'm not actually sure where, what I was there. Um, if you want to talk about, so it's interesting because when your poem nude stills is right next to uh, a drawing by Sumahi. So uh, Sumahi uh, uh, submitted uh, something uh, for this and it's right next to it. Yeah. And so uh, we've got it on screen right now. Are we getting uh, censored okay. for this actually? Saguaha Susu. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so this particular uh, poem, um, I write some things that are very um, political. Um, usually, I say a lot of perhaps incendiary things, but um, I write a lot of very um, personal, semi-coded things as well. Um, uh, this one, so for people that don't me, know me, obviously, uh, I, I um, was born in the States, came to Guam um, before I could remember anything, but then left again when I was seven. And I grew up in Washington State um, for you know many years. I lived there over two decades and had a, what I'm realized is an interesting life. <laughs> um, but no, uh, there was a time I was living off the grid for a few years um, in the forest in Eastern Washington. And I wrote this, um, I think it was a fall, an autumn. I was laying on the floor in my shack in my little cabin and I was listening to music and just thinking about um, like in the forest, but also uh, like in the forest, all the things that come and go that no one ever sees and no one ever knows. Thinking about history um, and all the parts of, of us and that no one knows, every person that no one ever takes count of and parts of really beautiful and tragic, you know, things that have happened that people just don't remember. Um, and then some of this also, you know, thinking about in our own history for tomorrow's, um, how we've only, the, the way we've been documented has been people from the outside looking at us and then writing down what they think they see. And there's so many things in that, that blind spot for those people. And for me, it was like, it doesn't mean that those things aren't there or don't exist or that they're not important or, you know, and I just, this was for me like a feeling of loss, but also a celebration of all those secret things. I feel like there's this beauty and things not being known to be honest, um, but they're still like a part of you, a part of all of those things. I don't know, like you can't have life without it. So I don't know, that's why I wrote this. <laughs> And uh, Matalik is also a frequent guest on Finanzu. Yeah. <laughs> and... yeah. Um, so this one that's on the screen, uh, Tip of the Spear, this is actually uh, lyrics from my band. Um, actually, uh, I sing for a hardcore punk band here on Wuhan. Uh, and we're called Spear. Um, and there's a lot behind that name. It seems so simple, just one, you know, single <laughs> word, Spear. Um, but yeah, part of it is attached to this thing we hear about Guam all the time, the tip of the spear, you know, for America, for the military forces. And, but, you know, there's so much more to it. 
Um, spears can protect, spears can hurt, spears can provide, you know, um, and then it's very relevant for us too, because, you know, the military claims the spear of Guam, but we have our own spears, you know, we used our spears in the Spanish World Wars and, you know, feels like a lot of us have set our spears down and we feel like spears should be taken up again. But um, so that's part of this, these lyrics right here, actually, it's um, we're so tired of sitting on a spear. We're so tired of being part of a spear when, you know, we have our own and we need to bring those back. just <laughs> Masi. Metallic, we'll come back to you, but let's uh, introduce our last contributor. Ha'ani and uh, put for but oh love the love the fauna love the fauna fauna uh, background hunger. Sisos ma asi mga sisos ma asi independent guahan niyong kumbibida zogwini. My name is Ha'ani. I was born and raised in Guahan, and I just moved to Oahu to uh, finish my PhD in Indigenous politics. And as many of you know, Oahu is the unceded kingdom of Hawaii, and it's the ancestral homelands of um, the Native Hawaiians. So um, I just wanted to honor that space I'm in right now. Um, but before I share my poem, I guess I'll talk a little bit about my inspiration behind it. So um, I was really inspired by you know the call for the zine and obviously like the topic of decolonization and I really thought about what is quintessentially Somoru to me and I immediately thought of my nana my grandma her humor her sarcasm and just her mannerisms that's obviously present in the beginning of the poem and then I also thought about you know things that are also inevitable to me. I believe that decolonization is something that can happen. Um, and I know that others don't feel the same way, but I thought there was a big connection between that culture or our culture and that inevitability. So um, yeah, so that's how I kind of tied those two topics together. So um, I'll go ahead and read my poem. I don't know if it's gonna be, oh, there we go. Okay, so the poem is titled Genenes Nana. My Nana said that Tomorus are naturally curious. We ask Sahafa and Hadzi and Manu more than we say our own names. And like every Tomoru, my Nana knew everything. She was always right. I think of her when I wonder, when I wander and dream and think and imagine. What if we were independent? What if instead of casting away our diaspora from the table, we cast a net and bring them inward to our shores? And what if we collectively acknowledge that our oppressors thrive by pitting us against each other by enacting a politics of distraction rather than a politics of connection? And what if we stop searching for pieces of freedom from an overseas oval that strips us away from all abundance that makes us free? What if we recognize that the bones of our ancestors lie within the land beneath us, one by one desecrated and unearthed by colonial cranes and caterpillars and that the only thing separating us from that same fate is time. What if we didn't have to ask what if, because we believe that when Nana sang of liberation, she was envisioning our future. When we stand together and pose the what ifs out loud, we are not exposing gaps in our knowledge or unveiling our separation or conveying a weakness, but we are remembering that our questions are as natural and inevitable as decolonization in our lifetime. And we persist so our descendants can live to ask a thousand more. So yeah, so that's my poem. Um, I don't know if we want to talk about it now or I can wait to the questions, but um, Sizos Maasi for allowing me to share this work with you all and for being in the company of so many other great um, artists, poets, photographers, and writers. Sizos Maasi Ha'ani. And so, yeah, we've got, we've got some questions coming in. And so, um, the first one I wanted to actually ask for Helen, off a day, Helen. And so we have a question. Um, so someone was interested because you mentioned that you'd worked on zines for other groups. And so they just wanted to know uh, what was the, the focus, the campaign focus or sort of the work focus? What kind of the issues that the other zines or the other groups that you worked for that they were uh, focused around? Um, so I guess my zines have mostly been around migrant 
rates in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and yeah, my kind of um, community organizing work started with, um, you know, grassroots organizing and domestic and family violence prevention for migrant women and youth of color. So a lot of my work is based on that kind of background and um, we've been releasing zines around like anti-racism um, to like zines around recipes and how it could preserve knowledge for from our ancestors. Um, yeah, so I do a broad range of zines. We just released a zine called Together Apart, which documents how I guess people in diaspora can stay connected during the pandemic um, and what that looks like digitally. So I touch on a lot of different things, but yeah, most of it is around, I guess, migrant solidarity and even talking about um, kind of migrant indigenous solidarities in Aotearoa as well, which is why I was also very interested in helping out with the scene. Yeah. Thanks, Idris Masi, Helen. And so this is a, a question for any of the contributors. Is there any... Um, are there any living Chamorros? Because many of you talked about sort of being inspired by, by those who have passed on, whether our recent ancestors or our ancient ancestors, but are there any living Chamorros that inspire your work? And uh, anyone can, uh, Leah, put for what? And then if anyone else wants to, you can uh, share after Leah. Um, I have been studying Daughters of the Island by Dr. Laura Schroeder and um, I think she just being able to walk into Mark and find this book and like have something to take to California and still like feed my soul in. And this is a collection of stories of women who were um, community organizers. So it's, there's 13 different women that I could read about that's like, everyone is Ha'ani's Nana. And I think that it's, it's so awesome to like have a real published book and like a living person to look up to in that sense. Can I quickly just add on because I was going to say Sina Lo as well. Um, she's the first published Chamorro woman author. So um, her and other Famalawan obviously inspire me personally because um, I'm also Samoan. So two different um, matrilineal and matriarchal societies. So I'm very much empowered by women. Um, but another work that was just published was Julian Uggin. So um, he's someone who inspires me as well, his poetry and his activism. Would anyone else like to share? Matalik and then Jill, oh, everyone, everyone jump in. That there's plenty of food at the table. Don't worry. So uh, go ahead, Matalik, and then Jillian, and then Clarissa. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, um, for me, I don't know if I can pinpoint any particular like leader or um, like any one individual over another, but I would say just everybody, uh, ultra morals and people on Wuhan that I come into contact with on a daily basis, uh, both positive and negative things. Um, you know, uh, everybody who's doing everything they can for their family and uh, everybody who's struggling, you know, um, people who are not doing all the best things and people who are doing everything they can in their power to make this island better, you know? Um, I mean, that's, it's, that's how, you know, that's what influences what I, what I write about, um, is just the everyday experience, I guess, of just living on the island and who we are, not just one single person or not just uh, the way we're supposed to be, like an idealization, but just how we actually are, you know? Uh, Jillian? Yeah, for me, I wouldn't say it's necessarily one specific person, but uh, some, some people I think about a lot when I'm doing my work is um, young folks, the nannies, um, especially when I see um, pictures of young people at protests, so since I'm over here in Washington, that's really inspiring to me, and I'm always thinking about what 
stories am I passing on and what stories am I creating um, for the next generation? So I also uh, strive to create work that makes young people feel seen and empowered because that wasn't necessarily something that I felt I had when I was younger. So yeah, that's what um, inspired a lot of my work. Sejus Masi, Clarissa. I just want to ditto everyone. <laughs> Everyone that mentioned anyone, I was going to say what Metallic said, which is um, every every living tomorrow person ever in all, of all time has inspired me and does continue to inspire me. And um, my friend Lehua Taitino, um, she has this book, Inside Me an Island, and the opening piece in it is a love letter to the tomorrow people in the 21st century. And I'm just going to read the first line because I think it summarizes she says, I will begin this in the middle since all of my letters have always been to you. Even if you haven't realized it, go back and look, you'll see all of my imaginings, my histories, my deaths and rebirths, my love and heartbreak, all my words. So I feel the same. I think we all feel kind of feel the same in the Zoom space together. And and so here is a question again for anybody who has a, who has some thoughts to share. Um, how can art, because uh, many of you are in the diaspora or from the diaspora, whether uh, that sort of you were born, raised in the diaspora or you're temporarily there because of school. And so how can art help us overcome the divide between those in the islands and those in the diaspora? Because one thing that's nice about spaces like this, of course, is that um, we aren't talking about these issues the way that, let's say, my my uncles or even my grandfather would talk about, as if Chamorros in the states have some sort of terrible cancer that that they get with their Costco card, or they get with their Best Buy membership or something like that, because they have all of these fancy, wonderful things. They think that they're better than people in the islands. Also, people in the islands think that those in the diaspora have no connection to culture, have no understanding of any of the issues that affect those at home. And so what I love about conversations like this is I don't feel like I'm rolling my eyes while I'm hanging out with all my older relatives and they hate on each other. About Chamoron Vegas, oh, esti Chamoron Guahan, oh my goodness, everyone sucks, everyone's so terrible. And so what are your thoughts though on how art can help us overcome? the divide that exists, it still does persist, but what can art do to help us overcome that? And whoever would like to, Leah, and then uh, anyone else, just let me know, but Leah, go ahead. I, I am thinking of this from just like art in general. Um, I feel like I make art that, it, that's tied to my identity. And what I've shown out in the States has brought connections for me to other people of color because their, their experience in white America is somehow connected to what my experience as a Chamorro woman is. And so I think that when I get to see a really amazing artist on Guam share stuff on Instagram, it makes me so excited and it makes me inspired to like make my own thing or start my own art stint. And I think also social media platforms being able to keep us connected so much has also helped me create other cohorts of um, not even just Chamorro artists, just people from Guam, not everyone's Chamorro, but just like that's still having that, that family feeling, whether I'm here and they're there. Did somebody else want to, want to share some thoughts? Matalik, put for what? Okay, so uh, I have a personal story with this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I left Guam when I was seven and I lived in Washington state for a couple decades. Um, and it was, I, I got into like punk and hardcore and all that kind of stuff uh, there. And there was a time, I think it was like 2011. Um, I was really, really curious about, you know, is there any of this stuff on Guam? 
and uh, just interested in in music from Guam in general. And that's when I started like to learn and, and listen to Chamorro music. But also I found out that there were there were some like metal and hardcore bands in Guam. And uh, probably not a lot of people know about those things because <laughs> uh, even here it's a pretty small, relatively unknown scene. But uh, through that, um, I, I ended up finding contacts for a one Dr. Kenneth Goffigan Cooper, who uh, <laughs> I ended up emailing. And uh, he thought my email was a joke from another friend for a long time. And then he realized it was real and emailed me back and we made connection that way. So for me, um, art music in particular actually facilitated my connection to, you know, making uh, friends, I guess, allies who were here on island before I even moved back. Um, and then the music itself, uh, the Chamorro music, I mean, I didn't grow up around our language being spoken in my home at all, or even in a community of Chamorro people that spoke. Um, being that I was in Eastern Washington there at the time was not many Chamorro people and I especially didn't know all of them, just some of my family that was there. And so hearing Chamorro music was honestly some of the first moments in my life where I got to hear our language, um, like actually spoken, not just half a day, you know, um, and so that was a big deal for me, learning how things were pronounced and then just hearing it, period. And it's something I still listen to to try and, you know, know the small vocabulary I'm trying to maintain <laughs> um, and grow. But uh, yeah, I think that's important there. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, so in, in some ways, you know, if you're in the diaspora, you, you can connect back to, to the Marianas through music, you know. Um, but I also think too, uh, if you're an artist in, in the diaspora, you have a unique position. Um, you're more accessible for a larger market. And I think that if you are going to create art that actually you know, creates some sort of material capital for you, I think there's opportunities to use social and material capital to uh, talk about what we deal with here in the Marianas with, with colonization and you know, poverty with all sorts of things and to help back here you know that's another connection too is not just one way of things coming out of the Marianas and then going out to us to help nourish us while we're away um, but also to take what we can when we're out and give back you know because that's a reciprocal relationship so I love that I've I try to remind people about that every time I get that that it shouldn't be that uh you know because sometimes I hear Chamorros in the States who say, oh, you guys all know the language in Guam, you have so many resources, you should give it to us, you should help us. And it's kind of like, well, then you should also think, you know, I'm going to help you thatch your roof, but you also have to have to thatch my roof next month. You know, so yes, of course, I'll help you thatch your roof. But if you think that somehow one side is supposed to service the other, then you're missing the point. What is the sensuli, the reciprocal relationship that can come about because some somebody has better leaves, which are better for somebody's you know house to thatch the roof. Somebody has great pugwa and great tuba that they can share when you thatch theirs. And so let's all let's all work together. But is there anyone else that would like to to comment on this? It is it is a very important issue because as we all know, more Chamorros in the diaspora now than in the Marianas. And so it's not something where you can, oh, Jillian, uh, go ahead. Go ahead and finish your sentence. <laughs> oh, I, I was stalling. Okay. I, I, I was just stalling, <laughs> waiting for somebody to hot say, can I move? Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I really resonate with, with what's already been said. And like in my personal experience too, art has really helped me connect with uh, folks on Guahan, especially since uh, for me, my family is mostly here in the States now. I don't have as much family back on island. Um, and so art for me personally was a way for me to uh, navigate and kind of reclaim my identity and uh, figure out what that means for me and then put that out there like on social media, on Instagram and whatever and see if that resonated with anyone. And um, I'm really grateful and humble that it has and 
that has helped me to make a lot of connections with folks that I otherwise wouldn't have had that avenue to connect with. So I am really a big advocate for art as a way to build community and maintain connections and stay rooted. Sidhust Masi, Haani or Clarissa, or if not, then, uh, or Clarissa Hungan? Oh, Hungan, oh, sure. Oh, no, I... No. Hungan, <laughs> Guaha, Guaha Ponsongan? Okay, man, pinalokunay no na minalert zu. I thought you mullerted me. I had a, okay, kunsigi. Um, I, I, you know, I feel like art can reach um, across distances because it's a language we can all understand. Um. And even as a tomorrow people, if we're experiencing division, um, whether it's in, in poetry or visual art or music, the same one piece of art can touch many different people in, in different ways. Um, I just feel like there are some, some traumas that we experience as a colonized people that can only, like that pain can only really be expressed through art in the same way that there's some, some joys that we experience as indigenous people that can be expressed more fully through art also. Um, so yeah, I just think, you know, uh, art can help us pretty much come to a better understanding of our shared experience, whether we're tomorrow on island or off. So, and Hago Mas and Haani, do you, everyone else has jumped into Lost Pond. Are you I going to be the, okay, but for what? <laughs> yeah, I can say something. So. Um, I was born and raised in Guahan, so most of my time has been back home. So I do recognize that there is this tension and friction between diasporic Tomorrows and those who are born in the islands, not only in Guahan, but throughout the Marianas. Um, but I have found that art, either poetry through merch or like even Jillian's art I've seen, um, we can all come together on something tangible. And I feel that that's kind of hard sometimes if like with the Tomoro language, it's not, we speak it and we feel it, but, um, art gives us like this conversational aspect to talk about our grievances because we're all impacted by colonization in some way. So um, I think it's a really profound medium for us to like use to get to know one each other, to be familiar again. So yeah, that's my final say. And so let me, um, as a final sort of question, uh, because we, we are almost out of time, although technically we could go over if we wanted to, we could do the tomorrow goodbye if we wanted to and say goodbye 19 times on our way out of the Zoom room, into the Zoom parking lot, into the Zoom, to Zoom Lindas or Zoom Kings after that. But um, as a final question, and Helen too, if you wanted to share some thoughts, because um, somebody who has ancestral ties in Tumon sort of had a question or a comment basically about how art can help us get to deeper layers of things. So, um, the comment was about how the poem by Leah sort of allows you to kind of get underneath the tourist facade of something and how even if something has been destroyed and has been lost and it only you know exists in the in the memories of elders or sort of even in the in the pain that's in the blood and the bones you can bring it back in different ways in art so art can help you get through the layers that are there even if you can't see them anymore. And so I wanted to give a chance to anyone as a, to share sort of some final perspective and how their work or how art can help us get deeper into some of these issues. And so if anyone feels like, uh, like sharing, uh, let me know, cause I'm going to keep talking until somebody unmutes themselves. And I see, I can keep talking. I'm doing it right now until somebody unmutes themselves and spares me Please offer yourself as tribute so I don't have to keep talking. No, I'm just kidding. Matsalek, Sigi, Kazuku, Enigi, Nai. Okay, Sigi. Okay, so, I mean, things that are being said uh, with what Clarissa started saying really resonates with me um, as far as art being addressed, being able to address things. Um, so, a lot of what I write and with what I do in my band. Um, is it's conversations and it's it's things that I want to say that I cannot say all the time. You know, there's um, we're taught there's specific spaces and relationships and protocols and, and appropriateness that we're supposed to have for when we want to talk about things that we want to talk about. And if they're 
really sensitive things, really painful things. If there are things that we might feel alone in, you know, we um, personally, you know, that I feel alone in, or we we find that where we find ourselves feeling that we can't talk about these things. And for me, art is, you know, writing and and, and music is is a way for me to have that conversation for anybody who wants to listen, you know. And it's a way that I can be honest and and open and say things that I wouldn't feel like I could say to a lot of people in my life, um, but that there's somebody else who's going to hear it and they're going to feel that, or it's going to open up a conversation for somebody else that you know I feel like I still can't have with you know a grandparent or a friend, you know, and I think that's one of the really important things. Uh, for and, and why I keep doing it. Um, another thing too is, as long as it can be found, your art, you know what you make, it can be, it, it can still have that effect. So I could do this now, and in 10, 15 years from now, maybe somebody's gonna find it who needs that conversation, and I won't be there immediately to talk about it. But what I made will, and. You know, for me, that's it's important. Like, there's tomorrow music made a long time ago. Now, you know, 70s and 80s, mm -hmm. and even the 90s are a long time ago now. <laughs> and don't don't say that Munguma song and now the 90s are. Right, 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 right. No, no, no! Don't date us. <laughs> don't don't. Hafa, no, you you archaeologist? Were you like paleontologist here at the now? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> What I'm a, just kidding. Sidus yeah. Masi. I was like, uh, no, sorry, you're dating me. I was remembering that, like, I was talking to some a group the other day, and I was like, oh man, you guys remember when Gloria Estefan said bad shit about Guam? And everyone was like, who's Gloria Estefan? And oh, like, that what? Oh. <laughs> I agree. Anyways, okay. Sidus Masi, Matalik, who would like to go next? would like to go next and just remember and you don't have to I, I asked a question to kind of stimulate thoughts but if you just want to share some closing thoughts you can you don't have to sort of uh, address the exactly what I said but Leah if you did want to because the person who asked the question felt uh, uh, inspired sort of as somebody with ancestral ties to the Tuman area but lost the land because of the U.S. land takings sort of uh, the poem definitely appealed to them so if you wanted to, to share a little bit or anybody else? Well, I guess I'll share more specifically about that poem. Um, when, I was, when I was writing it, the, the headspace that I was coming from was um, just feeling so removed from, from any knowledge of our ancestors' culture. And the only thing I could think of was that Polly San Vittori's scary statue in Tumon and how like that's the image of ancient Chamorros that I had in my head. And as a little kid walking to the beach past it, you know, it's like a bad scene and it feels like they're like villains. And so I wanted, I wanted to write something that would change that, that would, um, <laughs> that would redeem them because they're not scary. They just, they wanted to live their lives the way that they always were. And um, I think one of the major things that I try to do um, specifically in my practice when it's tied to my identity is to honor that, that ancient Chamorro warrior in my blood. And speak that and make things from there because that's what's been silenced. And so um, it's, it, it's harder for me to have that conversation out here because I have to educate everyone about my culture and there's context that has to come. Like I can't, can't just have a sling stone. They're like, what's that football? Um, <laughs> but, uh, when I wrote Red Tide, I was really coming from that perspective of wanting to redeem our ancestors, wanting to redeem our culture. I think 
Um, my bio says that my practice is based in combating the erasure of culture because that's where my art comes from. Mm. All right, who else would like to, 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 to share? Larissa, oh. Hani, Gillian, or oh. Helen, or Annie Faye? Oh, go for it, Annie Faye. Thank you. Thank you for the floor. Eh? No, but uh, Saira Maasi, Leah, um, you know, when you're sharing your poem and you're um, choking up a little bit, honestly, I was choking up too. I was like, oh, girl. I was like, hey, don't do that to me. <laughs> but um, yeah, you know, when all of your submissions were coming in, when we first asked about it, um, it was a very interesting experience because um, don't tell my boss, but I was reading them during work, right? And uh, what is it? I was coming across a couple and I was talking to Matalik about this. I was like, hey guys, you guys got to listen to this. And I started like reciting some of you guys' work to my office. And it was, a. Uh, I just wanted to show them because I thought like, hey, this line is core, this poem is core, this, um, um, this uh, painting's amazing. And then it kind of turned into an office-wide conversation, which I really didn't expect because um, these people that I work with, um, I, you know, we see each other in a work environment and we kind of usually just talk about work stuff, right? I work in mental health. So a lot of the times when I'm talking to my coworkers, we're talking about clients or like things outside of work you know mental health related and we don't really get to talk about like things like this like decolonization and culture and loss and pain and all this other stuff but when we were kind of just reading the work aloud it was this kind of first time where we had conversations and I think kind of just talking about the whole what we've been talking about through this um through this Zoom is that I think art really takes fear out of conversation. I think it's um, hard for people to talk about things because sometimes you feel like you're, you're setting yourself up for a debate or you're setting yourself up for hostility. But when you're doing it through art, it, of course, there's still the fear and vulnerability and there's still a lot that you have to share and give up of yourself. But I feel like it, it gives such an amazing space for people to not be so afraid and to be able to ask questions because art starts the conversation as we all know, right? So it's like, what's that piece about? But it's not really just about like, you know, the colors or the wording you're using. It's about the history that you're putting behind. It's about um, the soul that you got into it. The, um, what was so important about this that you wanted to capture. And yeah, I, that's one of the things I really love about this scene and about all the pieces that you guys have brought in is because, um, it's a it's a really pretty booklet, yes, but the big picture of it is that it's a really it's a really great conversation starter for so many people that don't get to have these conversations and don't get to have these connections and don't have people that they talk to regularly about um, the fear and pain and hope and happiness that surrounds these kinds of topics. So again, I just want to say. Um, to all of you guys, I'm just really honored and grateful yeah. to be able to at least sit in, in this room, you know, even if I'm in the background, yeah. thanks for letting me be here and thanks for sharing your work with all of us. Mm -hmm. Hey, we should, should we end right there? That was a, that was a great way to close uh, anything. I don't know if, uh, but I think we can end right there unless... Clarissa or Jillian or Haani, did you want to share anything real quick before we go? Maulika? All right. Hey, pues si dus masi talo no hamzu todos. Guinigi holimi zun lo hamzu lo guinigi u me zan u me ekumok. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Thank you to Helen. Uh, Young, thank you to all of the artists, the writers who contributed to the Kulu Zine. Remember that you can find it on Independent Wahan's website, independentwahan.org. The link is in the comments. If you want to just download it or check it out online. If you want a physical copy, you can go to Asiga, Antigua Brewery, uh, Brewery 
Numatlu Refillery and Fauna Cultures on Guam and pick up a copy there. But yeah, I know how Parapago, Sidzus Masi. Good job, Anne Nife. <laughs> and everyone else as well. Adios, este kimana lihetalo. Sidzus Masi.